Welcome to this game theory lesson covering voting games. My name's Matt Rozu. I am dropping videos on game theory all semester as I'm teaching this course at Susquehanna University. Videos you can follow along free of charge. You can even do a few homework problems in there. So like and subscribe. Voting games are fascinating and really game theory applies quite well when thinking about voting games. Thinking through the logic on this, there are known rules with elections. There are certainly winners and losers at the end of elections. And then there's the discussion of how should people vote in particular races. To begin the discussion on voting games, we need to think about some definitions. First, the difference between a majority and a plurality is important. Majority of a vote is getting more than half of a vote. A plurality of votes is receiving the most out of any alternative. And that could be less than half. So if you have five candidates in a race and one has 42% and that's the highest vote getter, that's not a majority of the votes, but it is a plurality of the votes. Another thing to define is the idea of single peaked preferences. If someone's preferences increase to some best outcome, but then decrease, you'd say that their preferences are single peaked. An example, you could perhaps think about how much money to spend on a party. Perhaps you are thinking through where that, um, okay, to throw a good party, really you need to spend $200 to get whatever you need to, to host a party. Uh, anything less than that, let's say it's at $100, it's not so good, and every dollar more than 100 okay, you're getting a little closer to the optimal party in your point of view. Once you get to 200, you're at the max, and then 200 is really all you need. So every dollar after 200, okay, maybe you can do a bit more, but you didn't need it, so every dollar after is a little bit wasteful and it drops in value in your opinion. You'd say that's single peaked preferences. Uh, that would be different. A, a counter example of this is, let's say, same thing, you've got a party and you think 200 is the best. Um, after 200, spending 201, 202, $203, all of that's worthless. But maybe you could hire a musician for an extra $300 for the evening. So the next best is $500. That would be double peaked, right? 200 is best and then it's worse until you get to 500. And 500 might not be as good as 200, but it's 500 is better than 499. Uh, or 498 or 500, you know, 501, 502 in terms of the amount of spending. Another area where we want to define what we mean is with a median voter. Median voter is a voter where basically half of the voters in a population are to one side of the issue and half of the voters are to the other side of a particular issue. There is such thing as a median voter theorem where the idea of the median voter will hold an enormous amount of power and this really is pretty true in general elections because the person in the middle is often the swing vote. If you've heard in general elections that politicians are going after the swing voters, why would they care? Well, I mean, imagine if you're, you know, if you're competing for Democrats versus Republicans, many of those voters really know what they're going to do going into the race. The politicians might really be fighting over that middle 10, 15, 20% of the voting population that could be swayed one way or another in a particular campaign. And a person who lies at the true median, wow, they really have a lot of power in terms of the outcome you might expect in a particular race. More definitions. So strategic versus naive voting, and saying naive voting sounds really harsh, right? I mean, you could say, other people might say voting their conscience or voting with their heart on what they truly believe. Um, okay, we're cold calculating economists. We're going to say it's naive voting. But a naive voting is voting for one's first preference regardless of what the outcome would be. And a good example of that would be in the 2000 election, it was George W. Bush versus Al Gore. But about four or five months before, there were two others in the race. There was a Pat Buchanan 
and Ralph Nader. Pat Buchanan was polling higher than Ralph Nader much of the time. George W. Bush was actually able to capture most Buchanan voters and win them over in the end. Uh, Al Gore was able to win over most Nader voters, but Nader ended up with a higher percentage share than Buchanan. Some people, you could make the argument, given Buchanan and Nader had no chance of winning, voting for them could be thought, at least under our definitions, as naive voting. Strategic voting would be, okay, you really preferred Ralph Nader, uh, but since Nader won't win, would I rather vote for George W. Bush or Al Gore? In same thing with Buchanan. Would you rather vote for one of the two candidates that really would have a chance of winning going into the race? So strategic voting is voting for something other than your very first preference in the hopes of improving the outcome. And really, I would argue in most presidential elections, everybody's strategic voting. Everybody. right? You could write in anybody you'd want. Uh, are you really saying you wouldn't rather have your best friend or your spouse as president? Like, I mean, come on. The almost 99.95% of the population is strategic voting. Going to get a little bit more into the game theory here. What makes a good voting structure? So if there is a majority with naive voting, things get pretty easy, but often there's not. When there is not a majority in naive voting, what's a rule that might mean you have really picked the right candidate. Well, the Condorcet rule is kind of a basic applied rule here, and that says that electoral schemes should be set up so that if you have a case where an alternative candidate or some alternative would win in a two-way vote versus anybody, that candidate should be winning an election against multiple alternatives. And if you're setting up a voting scheme, you would want to make sure somebody who would win against every single two-way race wins the ultimate election. It is worth noting, not all games have a Condorcet candidate. There are times where A might be preferred to B, but B might be preferred to C, but C might be preferred to A in a three-way race. And then you just don't have one. If you don't have one, things get even trickier still. But if you are taking this class with me, there are problems we will look at and we will be asking, is there a Condorcet candidate? Before we finish out this video, I'm going to show a short clip from uh, the Game of Thrones and a voting game that happened to see who would head up the Night Watch. Does anyone wish to speak for candidates before we cast our tokens? for the 998th Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. It is time. Pretty big fan of that series. We see at the end came down to a single vote. Why do I bring this up? Ken Arrow came up with four rules for a good election scheme. That is that it should be efficient. So there is no alternative. Every voter would prefer to the winning alternative. That seems pretty basic. It should be complete that the voting structure leads to a complete and consistent ranking of preferences. It is neutral, so if there are irrelevant alternatives, that should not influence things, and it should be non-dictatorial, so that one person can't decide the election. And Kenneth Arrow famously 
in a paper came up with the impossibility theorem. Arrow's general impossibility theorem proved that there's no voting scheme you can set up that will actually satisfy all four criteria when you have multiple candidates. I'm going to stop on this video for our introduction to voting games. We will be talking more about voting games in the next video. So like, subscribe, and click the notifications bell so you'll be notified when the next one drops. And I look forward to seeing you in the next video.